All right. Good evening, everyone. How are we all doing? Thank you so much for tuning in to this evening's virtual Read of the Day book club event. My name is Anastasia, and I'm the Events and Marketing Manager for Bank Square Books and Savoy Bookshop and Cafe. Uh, and I just have a few quick pieces of business to get out of the way before we get into the good stuff. So many of you have already chatted in and told us where you're watching from tonight, which is awesome. Uh, we love to see people take advantage of the chat feature on Crowdcast throughout the event. So please keep doing that. And if you haven't already, chat in, tell us where you're viewing from, say hello. You can also ask questions either in the chat or via the ask a question button, which is right at the bottom of the stream. Uh, we'll get to audience questions at the end of the event. Um, so submit them through there. You can also vote on your favorite questions. It's really cool. And if you're joining us from Facebook Live, hi there. Thanks for tuning in on Facebook. Um, we're really glad you're with us. I will say that we cannot see your comments or questions. So if you want to join the conversation, just come on over here to Crowdcast. There's a link above the Facebook stream where you can tune in from. OK, now the most important feature of this platform is that shiny green button that is right below me here. And um, that says, buy the book. So if you click that button, it'll take you back to our website where um, you will be able to grab your own copy of The Red Horse. And James is actually going to be coming to Mystic tomorrow to do a socially distanced signing in our offices. So you'll have a signed copy of the book and he is willing to personalize them. So you can put that in your order comments. Um, so buy a copy of the book. <laughs> and uh, with that, it is uh, my great pleasure to introduce the September installment of Read of the Day. And this is a partnership between Bank Square Books and the New London Day. And this month, we're thrilled to be hosting James Ben to discuss the most recent installment of his Billy Boyle World War II mystery series, The Red Horse. James is going to be in conversation with Rick Coster, who is an arts columnist at the day, and he's also the champion on the day side of the Read of the Day book club. Some call Rick and I the Wonder Twins, but you know. Um, so I'm just going to give a little bit of background on Rick, and then he will introduce James more formally. So Rick has been working as an arts and culture writer at the day for over 20 years, and he specializes in covering music, books, and dining, and he also writes a weekly humor column known as Rick's List. He's an all-around stand-up guy. So Rick's going to take it away, and then um, we have a special guest with us this evening who you'll hear a little more about soon, and then we're going to talk about the book. And with that, take it away, Rick. Thank you, Anastasia, and thank all of you guys for uh, joining us here on another episode of our Read of the Day Book Club. And, you know, when we started this at the beginning of the year, it was in, in person with uh, <laughs> Lou Ann Rice, and that seems a million miles and a million years ago now that the, now that we've all been under quarantine and this almost seems normal now Anastasia I don't I don't know what you think but um, speaking of normal James Ben started writing these Billy Boyle mysteries about 15 years ago the Red Horse is his 15th uh, book in the series and I've been around since since book one so Together, Jim and I have uh, traversed across the entire globe and every every theater in the war, and it's actually lasted three times longer than the real war did. So here's to Jim's longevity, and I guarantee you when you read The Red Horse, you are not going to want him to stop anytime soon. Um, I think the, the best part of this is this is, we have, we have the surprise guest, and I'm gonna let Jim set it up because this sort of came out of nowhere and it is a wonderful surprise with all sorts of uh, two or three degrees of separation type uh, fun, you might say. So Jim, why don't you introduce our guest? Okay, I'd be glad to. Um, so I'll just say by way of uh, beginning the introduction that when I do book talks uh, or when I used to do them live in the real world, um, I would often do a reading from the book. Um, and uh, Rick and I got to talking about this and uh, I was telling him about um, Peter Burkrot, who is the audio, well, audible uh, and uh, uh, recording artist who narrates the audio books. And we thought, wouldn't it be fun to ask Peter to join us and do the reading and have a real professional uh, read the first chapter of the book? Um, now, Peter has been around for a while. He's done over 150 audiobooks. 
uh, 100 children's titles. Uh, he runs his own acting school called New Voices. Uh, he's won three earphone awards, which I guess are like the Emmys of the, the audio world. Um, but uh, last but not least, and probably what he's sick and tired of hearing about is his role in Caddyshack as uh, Bill Murray's uh, assistant. Uh, he's the guy who um, Bill Murray punches in the chest with a pitchfork and says, I, I got that going for me. Um, so I think both Rick and I are like fanboys of Peter at this point. Uh, so we've brought him along uh, to read to you today. And um, I'll now turn it over to Peter and have him uh, say hello and read from the Red Horse. Hello. I, was, I would say, can everybody hear me? But I wouldn't know if you said yes. Um, just a slight point. I guess Caddyshack speaks for itself. I don't have to anymore. But you do have an old bio, and as an actor, I just want to correct that. I'm actually moving at this point toward almost 500 audiobooks. I'm probably up to about 480. Um, same thing with the others. Children's books are probably close to 300. The Earphones Awards, I think, is 10 now. So not that anyone's counting, you know, still. And Caddyshack is 40 years ago, so. And Michael O'Keefe, who played the caddy in Caddyshack, the main caddy, just got... Uh, hired it, uh, to be a caddy at the U.S. Open at 65. So it's uh, it's the gift that keeps on giving. But I'm really just delighted to be doing this. And uh, I'll go ahead and just start, because if I were not to start, then there wouldn't be time for Jim. Uh, I'm going to do the first chapter, as Jim asked me to. And you may not do this when you're reading it, but uh, Billy does is from South Boston. So you probably read it with your own voice. I have to read it with someone else's. My accent being more Brooklyn. All right. The Red Horse by James Benn. Chapter One. Something was wrong. The wind bit at the back of my neck and I hunched my shoulders as great clouds scudded across the sky outpacing me as I trudged along the gravel path. I stuffed my hands into my pockets, thankful for the warmth, thankful I could hide the tremor in my right hand, because they were watching. I couldn't let them see how bad it had gotten. My boots scrunched on crushed stone, the wide walkway stretching out before me. It looked like a straightaway but the low wrought iron fence on either side curved slightly to the left. It was a circle, a long circle, but all circles, all the same circles lead nowhere, which was where I was, evidently. I don't know why. I haven't figured it out yet. All I know is that beyond the ornate fence, painted a gleaming jet black and hardly higher than my hip, there's another fence. A serious fence, in the woods about ten yards in. Ten feet high, and topped with coils of barbed wire, patrolled by British soldiers who watched from the other side, silently staring me down. I pushed on, trying not to attract their attention as they moved through the shadows beyond the wire. Two days ago, they'd let me outside. Not the soldiers, but the doctors, or nurses, or orderlies, or whatever they were. They said I could walk, that it might help me sleep. But I can't sleep a wink. Maybe that's why I'm a little confused. Sometimes it feels like I can't stay awake either. Or move, for that matter. I didn't want to go outside, but they insisted. So I started walking. Two days I've been walking this circuit. My eyes are gritty with fatigue. But every time I stop to sit on a bench, my lids stay open. There's a haze over everything. The woods, the guards, the massive stone structure constantly off to my left, its towers and turrets visible above the treetops and across the lush green lawns. My memory is hazy too. I don't remember how I got here, although I recall waking up in an ambulance. Before that, all I remember is France. Paris, to be Paris, to be exact. But everything is jumbled up like a dream. 
where things look familiar, but nothing makes sense. I know this place isn't a dream because nothing looks familiar and nothing makes the slightest bit of sense. It isn't a dream or a nightmare. No, it's worse. Why? The answer to that one was coming up ahead. The gravel walkway sloped downhill as it curved around the rear of the scattered buildings. I hadn't even counted them all. There was the main building, four stories of sandstone set down in front of a green lawn with a tall clock tower at the center. Wings extended off either end at right angles like giant arms, encompassing a smattering of smaller buildings, all covered in the same sooty stone soiled by the chimneys spouting coal smoke into the gray skies. A service road cut across the path ahead. The gate was set in the woods, part of the security fence guarded by soldiers. I caught a glimpse of them a few times as they opened the gate to let in trucks bringing supplies. Their forest green berets marked them as elite commandos. I didn't look in their direction anymore. They might think I was planning an escape which might not be a bad idea if I knew where to go. I quickened my pace as I passed the stone pillars that once had marked the entrance to the grounds. I could see the old metal sign that had greeted visitors. It was rusted and pitted by age, but still clear enough to announce what the place was. St. Albans Pauper Lunatic Asylum. I was sure I'd been here before. I hadn't seen the sign back then, but I'd driven to a back entrance to visit a British major. I hadn't stayed long, but I knew this was the same joint, except everything was different. Maybe because they'd let me leave that last time. So I know I'm at St. Albans, about an hour outside London, if I remember correctly. Not that my memory is all that good right now. I do know I'm not a pauper. But there are some strange people here, and the place is surrounded by barbed wire and guards, so I guess it is some sort of asylum. Lunatic. As I walked the path, I eyed the other residents, or patients, probably. I tried not to make eye contact, not being up for a friendly chat. I saw the whistling man, an American who strolled the circuit regularly as he whistled a tune. The same tune all the time. We passed each other. His eyes focused straight ahead and a little toward the sky, as if he were waiting for angels to swoop down and take him away. I came to a Brit sitting on a bench. His wool cap was pulled down, covering his eyes. His arms were crossed and his legs jitted, boot heels keeping time. I'd seen him around. He was one of the mutes. Never spoke. There were a few of them here, all wearing the British battle dress uniform. But that was all I could tell about them. Everyone was in uniform, but the rule at St. Albans was no rank or unit patches, no identification, except for the color of your uniform. Last names only. It made sense in a way. If the place was full of lunatics, it wouldn't do for a crazy colonel to start issuing orders to loony lieutenants. I picked up the pace as the path took me closer to the south wing. That was the medical area where people wore pajamas, bandages, and casts. They spent their time in bed, rolling around in wheelchairs or limping about on crutches. I hadn't run into any mutes or whistlers among them. But I hadn't been in the south wing. But I hadn't been in the south wing in a couple of days. I couldn't handle seeing cats. Lieutenant Pyotr Augustus Kazmierz, that is. Kaz and I worked together. We had some trouble in Paris and ended up here. I'm walking around and he's not. Bad heart. Really bad. My brain is sort of scrambled, but his ticker is shaky. He's always had some sort of problem with it, which is why he ended up as a translator working in General Eisenhower's headquarters. Kaz had been given a commission in the Polish Armed Forces based on his brains, not his brawn. But he'd built himself up, strengthening his body and using his brilliant mind as part of Ike's Office of Special Investigations. 
until Paris. Everything had fallen apart in Paris. Kaz's heart, my mind, and well, something else. I can't think about that now. I pressed on, head down, not looking at the medical ward windows for fear I'd see Kaz looking at me, wondering, worried about his future and my sanity. I didn't want to think about that either. Or that other thing, clawing at the edges of my mind. I walked faster, starting, I walked faster, staring at the facade of the main hall now that I turned the corner. A few faces gazed out at me from the offices at the front of the massive buildings. Bored typists, doctors in their white coats, a few uniformed honchos, Yanks and Brits who gave the orders around here. I made for the entrance, glancing up at the tall clock tower dead ahead, dead center. Ten minutes of five. But that time was only right twice a day. The thing was busted. I stopped, uncertain if I wanted to go inside or take another tour of the estate. I stood there, rooted to the spot, paralyzed by the simple task of deciding if I wanted to go indoors. This sort of thing was happening all the time, and I didn't like it much. Like I said, something was wrong. I stood still, unable to decide which way to go. Which is why I saw the two men up in the clock tower. The door to the tower was usually locked and off limits. They were nothing but blurs of brown uniform, heads and shoulders barely visible above the crenellated stonework as they scurried around, circling the white flagpole with the British Union Jack flapping at the top. Then there was only one man, and he was flying. Wow. Keep reading, dude. <laughs> Chapter two. <laughs> wow. No, I love the faces fantastic. you make when you read. Uh, it's, a, it's an aerobic exercise. Mm -hmm. It really is. Wow. Children, of course, <laughs> you keep sweating, but this stuff, it's just, God, it's so different. It's just something is wrong. I love it. You know, I, I've listened to, to your recordings a number of times, but I've never seen you act. And, and that was very powerful. Uh, uh, this was. Uh, I don't problem. really see it either, you know. I'm, stay, I'm, <laughs> in a, I'm in a four by four padded room, which is probably where I belong. <laughs> yeah. um, but. You know, I don't realize how much I rely on the rest of my body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot well, in there. Thank it's you so much, Peter, for reading. Oh. oh, thank you for having me. Anytime. Well, next year. Next year. Next year. Next year in uh, London. Yes, thank you, next Peter. Year. I wasn't sure if we were talking about the war or the war. <laughs> oh, well, next year, I just want to say brush up on your Russian. Russian is my favorite. I am from <laughs> Russian. It's much better than the time I you stuck me in Switzerland killed me. I had to talk to a lot of people in order to get that one. But thank you. You've really improved my dialect. <laughs> I do what I can. Oh, uh, can't wait for Russia. It's beautiful there this time of year. All right, wonderful. We'll let Peter go about his evening and um, dive into the conversation between Rick and Jim. Buy the book. Thanks again, Bye Peter. <laughs> Bye, Peter. Thank you, Peter. That was outstanding. There's, there's, there's that, one significant you know, we, I problem just, with that, Jim. I don't know if you feel the same way I do, but I don't even want to open my mouth now after with my exactly. Texas accent, and but, uh, <laughs> he he can bring it, can't he? That was outstanding. Yep. Plus, I didn't know there were two degrees of separation between Caddyshack and the twilight of World War II, but right. we established that, so that's good. Um, so we established um, also that that Kaz and Billy are in the St. Albans Lunatic Asylum, and you have hinted at this point that we know that Kaz has heart problems and that mm -hmm. Billy has something going on emotionally. Um, in case Folks up there haven't haven't read the book uh, or don't know the series. 
these guys are best friends. Uh, Billy is a U.S. Army detective, former Boston cop, and and Kaz is a lieutenant, as Peter read in the th in the uh, in in chapter one. So we got to figure out why they're there, and we learned that St. Albans is in fact a recuperative Allied hospital, but when you're well, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to leave because if you happen to have been involved in intelligence maneuvers or assignments and you're not deemed trustworthy for one way, not because you're a traitor or anything, but you're just emotionally not well, they can't let you out for fear that you will spill a bean, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of where they're at. And now there's a man who has either jumped or been pushed off the clock tower. And before you know it, a major from England, Cosgrove, shows up with some bad news for Billy and Kaz. And also he wants Billy's help in solving what happened in that clock tower. Mm -hmm. The bad news is that Billy's love of his life, uh, Diane, who was an espionage agent, Diane Seaton, is on her way unwillingly to Ravensbrück, a women's concentration camp the Nazis have. And we also learn that Kaz's little sister, Katarina, is headed that way too. So that's where all the plot leads at this point. And then somebody else dead shows up. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm going to start asking you questions. I hope I did that accurately enough. Sure, sure. Yeah. Right. So one thing that that Jim and I have spoken with over the years is I think I've written about every every book in the series is the idea you have of, of finding a historical nugget because mm -hmm. you told me from the word go that you thought I knew a lot about World War II. Fifteen books later I think you've come to realize that you learned a lot more than you thought yeah. was out there. Is that fair? Yeah, I, I, I thought I uh, was pretty knowledgeable. And what I discovered is I had a surface knowledge. And the, the way I approach this is to try to dig beneath the surface and find things that run counter to our beliefs and understanding about the war and challenge us to look at, at um, how the war was conducted in certain places. And that's really the theme of this book. Um, and having read it, you know, there's, uh, there's not a lot I can say because this is a book about secrets. Um, the title, The Red Horse, is a secret. Um, and it's why Billy encounters uh, that uh, uh, agent who uh, goes off the clock tower. Uh, and in his state, uh, which is uh, as a result of methamphetamine abuse uh, in the previous book, When Hell Struck 12, um, in that book, Kaz and Billy were on a mission to Paris just as it was being liberated. Kaz had a heart attack, a result of the stress he had put on his, his bad heart. Uh, and Billy had uh, come upon a supply of methamphetamines, which the Germans used like candy. Uh, and he used it to get through several days in Paris uh, to find Kaz and to try to save Diana Seaton. Uh, he found Kaz, but he, he failed to stop the Gestapo from taking Diana. Um, so he had an emotional and physical breakdown as a result of methamphetamine use. And that's the confusion that you see uh, in the first chapter. Um, and uh, this story really came about because I found um, an article uh, on the web about uh, psychological warfare in World War II and the various ways each side used uh, psychological operations. And there was a story there. Uh, and it, even though I have become fairly cynical about what was done on our side as well as the other side to win the war, uh, or to try to win the war, this one really shocked me. Uh, and I realized this has to be the basis of a book um, and we have to find a way to tell the story uh, and I found this setting to be of interest because the, well, the last two books were both very 
they were action packed. They were set in northern France and advance onto Paris. Uh, a lot of battlefield scenes, and I thought it was time to modulate the experience for the reader and, and draw back a little bit and go into sort of a locked room situation. And I thought that's the perfect place to bring out the story of the Red Horse. You you mentioned coming across this in a in an online uh, article, and I wonder. In, in our conversations in the past, Jim, you've, you've talked about what you call historical nuggets. Mm -hmm. And it'll be something like what you just found with a hospital or a facility like the fictional St. Albans. And how many books off the top of your head have, have just the idea for the plot popped up when you came across something? Because there's plenty you could focus on and, right. and, and have you know, from, from D-Day to the ghost armies, that sort of thing. Over the, you've even been in the Pacific theater, but when you're coming up, just reading along and something like that pops up, do you just get the, the proverbial light in the head and go, yeah. wait a minute, sort of thing? Uh, uh, that happened, now Peter mentioned the book set in Switzerland, which was called The Devouring. And that came about literally through a footnote at the end of a book. <laughs> um, I, I was reading a book about, um, French resistance, looking for ideas. And I found a footnote at the end of the book about a, a smuggling route to smuggle Jewish children into Switzerland. And that just, I had never heard of that. Uh, and the footnote was talking about how difficult it was to get past not only the German guards on their side of, of the border, but the Swiss guards on their side. And all of a sudden that just set up a whole host of questions. Uh, and then all of a sudden I knew that that's a book. There, there's a story to tell here. Uh, and it was the same with um, The Red Horse and uh, combining it with this, um, this hospital, which has its own basis in reality. Um, the uh, Special Operations Executive, the, the British uh, espionage group, did run um, a place sort of like St. Albans. It wasn't a hospital. Uh, but it was a remote uh, lodge on an island in Scotland. It was called Invalair Lodge. And it was where they would place people who were, as you said, had too many secrets to be let out. Some of them were agents that had been trained, briefed, were about to go on a mission. And either SOE decided that they didn't have what it took, or the agent froze and refused to go at the last minute. So their quandary is, what do we do with these people, these men and women? Can't let them out because they know too much. Um, so they would send them to um, what they deemed, that they called uh, number six special operations workshop. And they told them, well, we're gonna send you to another course and it's up in Scotland. And number six special operations workshop was in Valera Lodge. It had a lot of booze, it had good food. Uh, you could go fishing. You couldn't get off the island. There was no way, there were no boats off the island. Um, and they were just put on ice. And uh, oddly enough, the uh, uh, a writer uh, a couple of decades later wrote a book called The Cooler, which was based, which was a spy novel, a mystery set in, in Villa Lodge. Um, and that fellow was George Markstein, and that name pops up in the book. Uh, but George Markstein was the a co-producer of The Prisoner, um, the 1960s TV program with Patrick McGowan, if you, you remember that or people remember that. Uh, it was a groundbreaking series, but um, it was based on Invalo Lodge and the whole notion of a secret facility uh, that uh, you would place spies and in, in The Prisoner, it was after their retirement uh, where they were kept in, in permanent um, uh, seclusion uh, and comfort. Uh, so the, this whole notion has a uh, basis in reality. Uh, and I decided, well, they, it would make sense that they would have a hospital like that as well. And that gave us an opportunity for Billy to be with Kaz as we dealt with his medical issues and Billy's recovery and uh, the flying man. And that that brings me to something that I, you, you know, as, as someone that reads uh, not just for work, but for, for pleasure, a lot of mysteries and thrillers, particularly series where readers and fans become 
uh, you know, the, these characters are my friends and I'm mm -hmm. following them from one adventure or another. There seems to be two um, schools of thought in, in writerdom, if you will. Uh, in some of these series, the hero at the end of the book, whatever happens uh, during that book, that by the next book, everything's just fine. There's no cumulative toll or whatever. There's no real time uh, development or whatever. And that's, that, that, that's fine. You know, it happens, but you are not like that uh, in this series. And, and Billy and Kaz are in this place for very grim uh, reasons. They're in the fifth year of war and it's taken a brutal toll on them. Um, as a writer, is it is it difficult to age them uh, and, and have them go through this? Um, how far down the road do you do you look? Um, and then there's a second part of this question, but I'll let you answer that part. OK, part. Um, well, that was one of the reasons uh, to write this story as well, is to show that effect of the violence uh, on Billy and Kaz. Um, and to not have them be Superman and uh, you know Batman and Robin, uh, there's a toll, and it's a there's a melancholy aspect to this because they're considering the possibility that they won't be a team anymore. The Kaz's heart condition it was established in the last book he had mitral stenosis, and there was no real treatment for that um, before the war, uh, besides bed rest for the rest of your life, um, and at some point in this book, they, they're dealing with that reality. Um, Billy has to deal with his own uh, mental issues, but Cass, Cass's heart is more of a permanent uh, problem. And I, I think bringing them to that point uh, showed the effect of the war and how you just can't get away from it, even though they're in a safe place in England. There's death still around them. And there's the uh, the possibility of death in the future, and the breakup of of their relationship, of their friendship, their their being them being a team. Uh, and of course, Kaz wants to stay in the fight to find his uh, sister, uh, who's uh, in been taken prisoner in occupied Poland. So he's got a lot of motivators going. And uh, Billy, of course, wants to help him, but I won't say any more about that. Um, the second part of my question was that, respectively, as you just alluded to, Kaz has got to, if he's going to have a chance, he's going to have to undergo a procedure. Is that, am I giving too much away there? No, I, well, I think, yes, uh, there are some medical issues at hand. And um, I'll just answer the question this way. Um, the war saw uh, advances in, in medicine, tremendous advances. Uh, one of them was uh, operations on the human heart. And one thing I was astounded to find out was that before the 1940s, there was a uh, prohibition in the medical community about operating on the heart, even touching the human heart. It was thought to be so delicate that it could not withstand an operation. Um, and there really was no heart surgery uh, before the 1940s at all. Uh, there was a doctor, an American doctor named Dwight Harkin, who was sent to the Mediterranean Theater of Operations and had an idea that he could operate on the heart. And the issue that kept coming up was not a, a direct damage to the heart, but shrapnel that would travel through the bloodstream and become lodged in the heart chamber. And that was could be fatal that day or in 10 days or 10 years. Uh, so he started working on a procedure to extract bits of shrapnel from a beating heart. Uh, and his reward for doing that was to be fired. Uh, and, and this is how strong the almost superstitious prohibition was about the heart. Um, he was cashiered from the Army Medical Corps in the Mediterranean. Uh, luckily, the army found a spot for him in England just before D-Day 
and allowed him to do these experimental procedures. And he saved hundreds of lives. Uh, he devised a method for plucking uh, bits of shrapnel out of the beating human heart. Uh, he was really the first surgeon, uh, there may be an exception, but he to hold the human heart in his hand. Uh, he uh, trained all the heart surgeons that came after him. So a terrific individual, uh, real groundbreaking, uh, and went against all the tenets of the medical community at the time. Uh, he was a, a pioneer in ambulatory uh, recovery. He got men up that had just had their heart operated on that day to walk up and down the ward. That was unheard of back then. Uh, so anyway, uh, all that is a, a way getting around your question and saying that you'll see Dwight Harkin uh, in, in this book um, and a lot of other uh, medical uh, operations that, that were used uh, in a hospital with a lot of uh, people with emotional problems as a result of the war. Yeah, that, that I mean, Billy is not in there for physical maladies. Uh, he encounters some interesting, almost, well, yeah, again, I don't want to, I don't want to overdo this here, but there's some therapies there that maybe weren't there long before World War II. Um, there was a, a, there were a lot of attempts by the army to deal with combat fatigue uh, and close to the front, uh, they had a process they called three hots in a cot. If somebody was really suffering, they would bring them back from the front line. And sometimes back from the front line might be a hundred yards, uh, but to some area of safety, three hot meals, a warm place to sleep for a night, change of clothes, back onto the line. Uh, but they also had more uh, severe uh, uh, attempts to get people to go back uh, into the fight after they had been suffering through different kinds of breakdowns. Um, and one was electroshock therapy, um, just like we see in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Um, it was uh, startling to find out that that kind of electroshock therapy was actually first pioneered by an Italian psychiatrist in the 1930s who observed pigs being led to the slaughter in a slaughterhouse. And what they did was they would shock them. They would shock their two, uh, their, their frontal lobe, just like you would do with electroshock therapy on a human and not to knock them out, but to sedate them. So the, the pigs would go to their slaughter in a more docile fashion. That caught on and it, it was used in military hospitals uh, on cases of uh, men who were too uh, shell-shocked to go back into combat. They would give them electroshock therapy and then just like those animals, send them back to the slaughter. Uh, and uh, there's a record of a, a doctor with a, an American division in, uh, in France just before the Battle of the Bulge who just refused to stop doing it because he talked about the vacant look in their eyes as they were shuffled back to the front lines. Um, so that's one of the therapies that uh, is at work at St. Albans uh, Lunatic Asylum. Uh, and another one that's a little more humane was uh, the sleep cure. Um, a lot of guys were given a pill they called the Blue 88 uh, it was because it was a blue pill, but because it was as powerful as the German 88 artillery piece. And it would knock you out for 40 to 48 hours. You would just sleep. And it was sort of like hitting the reset button. Uh, and it, it did help. Um, and uh, the sleep cure was something that was, uh, uh, was used quite a bit. So that's part of what... Uh, what's going on in St. Albans, there's the South Wing where the, uh, the uh, uh, patients who have medical problems, physical problems are, and the North Wing where Billy is with the mutes and the whistlers and people who have a whole host of other problems. You know, I think on your website, Jim, you should have like a merchandise section like rock bands do and stuff, and we could click on it and buy a a Billy Boyle souvenir St. Albans lunatic asylum <laughs> sweatshirt. That's just something I'm throwing out there for you. But 
Uh, uh, idea. Um, I want to ask a writerly question. Um, if I pick up a Billy Boyle book, I know immediately by now that it's, that it's you. Like you have a, a rhythm and a style. Um, it's very smooth. It's eloquent without being grandiose or overblown, which is interesting, particularly because some of the settings you're describing are, are, are pretty vivid. But what I wanted to get to was because of the differing settings and the different situations that Billy and Kaz find themselves, as you said, the previous two books were heavily battle, battle intensive. This one is much more pastoral and sedate. And it's almost like you have to read outside what you do. You read different kinds of, of thrillers or mysteries. This one has a very British, almost Agatha Christie type feel mm -hmm. to it. Um, does it. Does that make sense? Do you see where yeah, I'm going yeah, with that? Yeah. Um, I don't know that I pick up a, a lot from the written word. I mean, I get a lot of data um, that goes into the books. Um, I think you mentioned rhythm, and uh, there, there's just a sense of not only the flow of words, but the movement of the characters. And Billy's walk in that first chapter is a good example of that. Uh, try to make the writing fit the physical pace of the character um, and show what's going on in his mind through his actions as well as his thoughts. And I think probably the biggest influence on my writing has been. Uh, uh, the movies and watching, uh, in particular, uh, Ran by Akira Kurosawa, which is um, a King Lear told in feudal Japan. Uh, and he has a, a, a beautiful way uh, with his cinematography of showing all the action and all the colors um, because he'll do it at times without sound. So you just see what's happening and the sound doesn't get in the way. Um, and that, that's, uh, I always go back to uh, that film in particular as a way of showing the rhythm and the pace and the horrible beauty in some of his battle scenes. Um, and he does it in a way that you wouldn't expect. There's no loud noise. It's just what you can see what's happening with the characters. Um, a quick interruption I see on our, on the, among the folks that are that are watching, uh, and welcome to all of you. Thank you for tuning in. But we've got some folks from the LA area, and now uh, Christopher's in from San Francisco Bay Area. And just a shout out to, to you guys uh, yeah. in the fire zone, man. I hope you all are safe and best luck with that. Um, uh, Jim, I have to bring up the the romantic aspect of this because Billy is deeply, as my father would have said, was deeply and uncontrollably in love <laughs> with Diane. And she is certainly present in the books and some of them more than others, but she's off screen a lot. Mm -hmm. And in, in that context, she has a very, um, an almost uh, spectral dynamic to her. It, it's, it, absence makes the heart grow fonder, that, that mm -hmm. thing. But it's easy for Billy to, in horribly stressful situations, to give her these angelic romantic qualities. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. um, is how, how much are we going to find out about what happens <laughs> with them? Well, uh, you know, I think in this book, both uh, Diana for Billy and Angelica for Kaz represent um, the, what they're fighting for, what they're struggling for. Although both women are fighting themselves as well. Uh, Angelica is a member of the Polish underground army. Uh, Diana is a, a SOE agent um, and they're both in grave danger uh, as we know. Uh, so I think for the, the main protagonists, they do represent uh, something to strive for and if they can make the world safe, particularly Kaz, if he can make the world safe for his uh, younger sister, um, that will be a victory of sorts. Because, you know, Kaz to me represents 
the Polish people who really were betrayed at every turn uh, in the Second World War. Uh, they were attacked by both sides, by the Germans and the Russians. They were betrayed by the Americans and the British when the Russians took over at the end of the war. Um, they were the only uh, fighting force that was prohibited from marching in the victory parade in London in 1945 because Stalin uh, didn't want the free poles to have any place uh, in the victory celebration. And uh, the Americans and the British caved into that. Uh, and there was a, a widespread feeling in Great Britain, even though the Poles had fought in the Battle of Britain, they had fought on the ground in Italy and in France, um, they had helped save England. There was a feeling at the end of the war, and there are po government polls that show this, that there were too many Poles and they should be sent somewhere. Now, where? If they were sent back to Poland under communist rule, they would end up in the Gulag. Uh, but the British people, by and large, um, didn't like the, all these foreigners hanging around after the war was over. Um, so uh, Kaz, to me, has a, is really a tragic character, even though he's full of life. Um, he knows that the, uh, there's no place for him to go uh, when this war is over. Uh, and we see a little bit more of that in the book I mentioned, uh, that's the next book, which will be set in Russia, uh, which brings that home even more clearly. I am I'm, I'm, I'm interested uh, in knowing over the course of your research, I, I remember growing up and my, you know, I, it's weird to think about now, but I was born only 10 years after World War II ended. And as a little kid, that seemed a million years, you know, yeah. and now you look back and go, oh my God, we were just right at the end of it, you know. Uh, but, but anyway, my father, I remember he had all the volumes of Churchill's World War II history, mm -hmm. and he would read from it, and he was a veteran. Mm -hmm. uh, he even read Mein Kampf. He seemed to, he wanted to know more and more about mm -hmm. that which he had experienced. Can you say with any certainty that you have read one history of World War II that stands out to you as as what you the one you got the most out of for a variety of reasons a absolutely and it's not quite a history of the war it's a history of uh, the u.s army in europe and that's rick atkinson's liberation trilogy and i think the first book is called an army at dawn um, and i forget at the moment the title of the next two but it's a three volume series that talks about the evolution of the American army in Europe uh, from the early days and the mistakes uh, in North Africa and, and through the end. And I've gotten a, a, lot, of, a lot of little tidbits uh, in my books have come from that uh, series. Uh, the, the book set in Northern Ireland, um, uh, forgetting the title. Anyway, the, uh, one of the characters had a, a good luck charm, a carved, uh, elephant that he kept with him. And that was from Rick Atkinson's book because he talked a lot about the talismans and the good luck pieces that, that soldiers kept with them. He ends the third volume with a heart-wrenching description of the facility in the United States that all the personal effects of uh, dead GIs were sent. And it, it it was stunning to read. Um, so, again, it's not the whole war, but if you want a, a good sense of what it was like for Americans in the European theater, uh, the, the Liberation Trilogy uh, would be my choice. Excellent. Um, I'm looking here. Uh, Anastasia, I'm wondering if we should we should go to questions now. And thank you so much, Jim. I, oh, I, sure. I just enjoy listening to you talk about your creations. Hello, gentlemen. Thank you so much for that really intriguing conversation. I can't wait to read the book. And I, Peter's voice is still stuck with me here. Yeah. Um, he, he really does a great job um, bringing the character to life, which is just marvelous. So um, 
Our first question actually in that vein um, was posted while Peter was reading. Uh, and I'm just gonna scroll back up here and see if I can pick it out. Um, Judy asked, how many of the Billy Boyle books has Peter narrated um, in audiobook? Do you know? I think there was a, a, a different narrator for the first three, perhaps, but first three or four, but after that, uh, Peter's done 10, 11 books. And we'll yeah, wow. Now. That's amazing. That's really, that's a pretty long tenure to be yeah. um, the narrator for, I mean, even having 15 books in a series is so remarkable. So that's very cool all around. <laughs> Um, so I've got another question from the audience here and just a quick call to action to our audience. It's so great to have so many of you joining us out there and definitely submit your questions either in the chat or through the ask a question box and then we can ask them to uh, Jim and Rick. Um, so just, you know, put them in the chat or submit them through the question field and I'll read them for you. And to that point, uh, Gerald Rosen asks, how important is it to read the Billy Boyle books in chronological order? Uh, you know, I, I try to write them so you could pick up any one. And, and the funny thing is, this book, I thought, might not work that way uh, because it's it's built on the events of the previous book. But I've heard more people say that, um, oh, I picked this up for the first time. It was great. And now I'm going to go back and read the others. So uh, I, I don't know. If, if you were going to start, pick one, you might as well pick the first one. But then I think you could jump around and have a be able to uh, keep track of what's what's happening. Okay, very cool. As, as a Thank reader, I, as a reader, I'm going to interrupt. I I, uh, I think you can pick them up individually, but sort of as we discussed uh, on the cumulative toll of Kaz and Billy, you might very well go, wait, how did that happen, and when did that happen? But but yeah, I I have read out of order. But yeah, start at the first if you can. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually, so to that point, in terms of timeline, do they jump around in their timeline or are they sort of all happening within a, a, a reasonable enough bubble where that picking them up, you're not going to feel totally out of the timeline? Uh, right. They, they do follow the war chronologically and it's a linear series. And as I got into it, I realized the great wisdom behind Philip Kerr's uh, Bernie Gunther series, uh, because he's a German detective. Uh, during, before, during, and after the war, and Kerr uh, would write those books out of order. He might have one set in the 1930s, the next one would be 1970, um, the next one 1940. Uh, wow, wow, what a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? But I, I can't do that now. So we're following the course of the war, and I'm working uh, at, at finding events that fit uh, chronologically uh, and are appropriate. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. So um, Tom asks, um, he's, he phrases this, but it might not be so much of a question as it is a comment, um, but he's asking whether or not we've seen St. Albans before. He, he notes that he feels like he remembers uh, coming across it in Rag and Bones, and then mm -hmm. again, a Polish agent is suffering. Yes, um, I've used this, I've had this idea for a long time, I never realized how I could develop it. But St. Albans, yes, I think it was twice uh, where I needed a hospital and a, a secure place. And I just looked on the map once of England and saw St. Albans. That sounds good. Um, so, yes, good, good eye, Tom. <laughs> Very good, Tom. Thank you for that question slash observation. Okay, um, so this is a good one. And I know we already know that the setting of our next Billy Boyle book is going to be Russia. But uh, Ken is wondering if you have anything on the docket that is not part of the Billy Boyle series. Um, yes, I do have two standalone books that are out, uh, Souvenir and On Desperate Ground, both are World War II related, but but not part of the Billy Boyle series. I've also just finished a, a manuscript that I'll be sending to my agent pretty soon called the Elsinore Sewing Club. And uh, it's set in Denmark. It's a young adult manuscript uh, set in Denmark in 1943 with the escape of the Jews to Sweden. Uh, and I found out about a, a, an organization, an underground organization set in Elsinore, which is where Hamlet's castle is, uh, which is also the closest point to Sweden. It's only like six kilometers across the water. 
uh, and they call themselves the Elsinore Sewing Club so that if the Gestapo is listening to a phone call, they would think they were talking about their wives' sewing club. Um, so that's going to tell the story of uh, uh, how this uh, uh, escape operation uh, really uh, worked uh, in a nuts and bolts kind of way through the eyes of a, a, of a, a young person. Very cool. That's so awesome. Um, so one question that has been very front of mind for people as we have existed throughout the pandemic is what have you been reading? Can you tell us what's been on your to be read list? What maybe you loved this summer? Oh, uh, boy, I just fit, uh, picked up uh, one of the um, uh, Ian Rutledge series. I'm drawing a, a blank on the, um, the author's uh, names but anyway um and uh i wish i had my kindle here i could take a look for you but uh, i spent most of charles todd somebody just popped up yes i don't know how i could forget them uh but it's the uh, latest in the ian rutledge series uh and he they have a fantastic protagonist is a shell-shocked uh world war one veteran who's a, a police uh inspector uh in england um uh, and I just love the setting of those books and the, the whole notion of this guy struggling to get through his his uh, his mental problems and uh, solve a uh, murder, a case of murder. Um, and then uh, I think I'm trying to remember a nonfiction title, but it's uh, I, I read a lot of nonfiction. Some of it is less interesting as a reading experience and more as a discovery. Uh, um, but um, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that. Rick, do you have any other questions? It looks like we've queued through. Our audience is a little more shy this evening. <laughs> well, I think that's because of my incredible efficiency as an interrogator. That's I completely true. agree. Yeah, I think, I think so. No, um, no I, I, I just want to thank Jim, not only for taking part in this, and of course, Anastasia and Bank Square for partnering with our, our book club, but uh, also, thank you, Jim, just for, for writing the books. You know, it's nice to have, we know that every year I, I can check in and, and Billy and Kaz will entertain me. So it's, uh, yeah, yeah, I do have one question. You, you are a retired librarian. Did you, did you write the first one just sort of, and I know you had written before, mm -hmm. but did you ever anticipate that this would be a, a series that, that went on and on? Uh, no, I, I never, I, I never envisioned that I would be this lucky. Um, I had the first two books written before they were bought by Soho Press, um, and I was on the verge of giving up because um, we just didn't didn't get anywhere. Uh, I, I, for any writers out there, I went, through, I stopped counting at two hundred rejections from agents, just to represent me, and kept going and had plenty more, but finally uh, took one agent took one publisher and and here we are and here we are the mm -hmm. tale of um perseverance in, mm -hmm. in the, the journey of the author i think is is very common and um it's, it's uplifting because i i think we all view rejection in this way where it's it's so disheartening but to be an author you have to be so resilient and have such a, a thick skin and a can-do attitude mm -hmm. um and there actually is one more audience question which i think ties in really nicely to sort of rick's final question there. Uh, and Christopher Reese asks, has there ever been interest to adapt the series to film or television? Um, and is it something that you would be interested in doing? Well, yes. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'd be very interested. And we've had different levels of interest expressed. Uh, there's uh, some talk going on at the moment, but it's in the super early stages. So um, just, you know, I keep telling people, if you like Foil's War, just wait for Boyle's War. <laughs> oh, man, that's great. Well, um, before I do my final spiel, uh, I just want to say thank you so much to both of you for joining us. Rick, as always, you're a great interviewer, and um, you make these so interesting. And Jim, thank you for taking some time out of your evening to talk with us. And our audience, thank you guys so much for joining us for another virtual event, for another read of the day. Uh, we love that we're able to continue doing these. Um, and now my final pitch here. Um, 
grab yourself a copy of The Red Horse. Uh, like I said, Jim's going to be stopping by tomorrow, and we're going to have a nice little social distance signing up in our office. Um, so if you'd like a signed copy, you can put a note in your order on our website. Um, I can't wait to read it myself. And um, I hope you'll join us for one of our other forthcoming events this Sunday at 2 p.m. Eastern. We will be hosting Yag Yassi for her new book, Transcendent Kingdom. And then uh, if you're in Eastern Connecticut local, you'll know about our One Book, One Region. And that event is on Monday night with U.S. Po US Poet Laureate, uh, Joy Hartshow. So you can check out more upcoming events on our website. And thanks for tuning in to this one. Rick, Jim, thank you guys so much. I hope you have a great okay. night. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. All right. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.